Let's try that again. Good afternoon, church family. All right, I was only testing the mic. <laughs> All right, it's so good to be in the house of the Lord again. And we need a, a message from the Lord this morning. I don't know about you, but I'm standing in the need of Jesus this morning. You know, as a nation, we recognize the month of May as Mental Health Awareness Month. And so many families and individuals are impacted by mental illness. The numbers are staggering. Storms in all the domains, the biological realm, the psychological realm, the sociological realm, the spiritual realm, as well as the cultural realm. They are coming at us from all angles. How do we survive? Is there a blueprint to survive the storms when we are in them, when we face them? And so to frame my message today, I want to share with you some stats before we go into the message. Mental health stats. Hopefully it comes up on the screen. There are co these conditions, the mental illness, is a condition that affects a person's thinking, feeling, behavior, and mood. These conditions deeply impact day-to-day -day living, as you are aware, and may also affect the ability to relate to others. Here are some stats. Did you know that 21% of U.S. adults experienced mental illness in 2020, representing almost 53 million people? Hmm? The numbers are real. And just a year after that, in 2021, 228 22.8, almost 23 percent of U.S. adults experience mental illness, representing almost 58 million people, increased by 5 million in one year. This represents one in five adults. So just look around. Any five, group of five, one of us has been impacted by mental illness in one way or another. 5.5% of U.S. adults experienced serious mental illness in 2021. 14.1 million people. One out of 20. So again, divide up the numbers here. 16.5% of U.S. youth aged 6 through 17 experienced a mental health disorder in 2016. This is the latest stats we have. Representing one in six. And by the way, these numbers are coming from the National Alliance of Mental Health, Mental Illness. National Alliance on Mental Illness. Here's another one. 7.6% of U.S. adults experience co-occurring substance use disorder and mental illness in 2021. 19.4 million people. The numbers are staggering, friends, brothers, and sisters. 50% of all lifetime, listen to this, 50% of all lifetime mental illness begins by, the, by age 14. And 75% by age 24. Are you within this age group? Do you have children within this age group? How are we supporting each other? How are we supporting our young people? Mental illness is a condition that affects a person's thinking, feeling, behavior, and mood. 
and then racial and ethnic minorities less likely to seek out service or receive services. And in fact, when they receive services, they tend to end services earlier than other ethnic group. Right? Some pastors are spending time in pastoral counseling equivalent to that of many marriage and family therapists. Up to 70% of time spent, which is above and beyond their pastoral care responsibilities. Members are being affected, right, by mental illness, sociological problems. A mental health condition isn't the result of one event. Research suggests multiple linking causes. You know, problems or crises take more than just one problem, right? To make it or get it to a point where you feel as if you can't survive or you can't surmount the odds. But when you have things coming from you from all directions, from all angles, right? Three and four issues all at the same time, that's when it becomes a problem. That's when you feel as if you know, what you're going through does not match the resources that you have. And that's when you get discouraged. That's when you get despondent. That's when you lose hope. Genetics, environments, and lifestyle influence, whether someone develops a mental health condition, is also contingent on these factors. A stressful job or home life makes some people more susceptible, susceptible as do traumatic life events. And then some biological or biochemical processes and circuits and basic brain structure may also play a role. Look at this picture. I don't know if many of you have heard about this guy. Harrison Okin, a Nigerian. In 2013, he was off the mangrove coast of Nigeria in a tugboat. Tugboats that were, fill that were pulling the oil tankers. And he was the cook. And if you do a quick search on YouTube, you'll find his story there. But about 5 a.m. in the morning, he decided to get up early to make breakfast for the crew, a crew of about 13 or 14. Went to the restroom, and by the time he got to the restroom, a swell of waves from the water came and overturned the tugboat. Broke a hole into the hull of the boat. It started to go down to sink, so he rushed out of the bathroom. And by the time he could get to safety, another wave, a rush of water came and pushed him into another small pocket in the boat, the tugboat. And he saw three of his crew members being swept away into the water. The boat, the tugboat, sank miles. I don't remember the, am the amount of miles, the, the, the exact amount, but miles beneath the water. And he came, he tried to come out, and see, because he, the water pushed him into this little room, which was like with ear pockets, that he could take some breaths. And so each time he would swim down to see if he could escape, but he couldn't. And he finally decide, decided to rest and take a break. And say, you know, how can I plan to get out of this? He stayed down there 60 hours, almost three days. Thank God for the little ear pocket that he had. And it was some survivors or some divers from South Africa that rescued him after 61 hours of being there. And when the divers came, he said, okay, they said he didn't want to secure the diver so that he pulled out his jackknife and hurt him. So he basically, you know, slowly waved his hand in front of the camera so the folks on top of the water could see him and so they could provide a rescue team for him. He said, all he was doing was, was crying on the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, save me. Jesus, Jesus, save me. Do you feel like Harrison this morning? What are you faced with? Huh? 
What challenges or circumstances in your life that's caused you to be feeling this way? So I just want to share a message with you this morning that I believe is a blueprint for what we need to implement to survive the storms of life. You know, as I said before, my wife and I and my other daughter, we lost Gabby, our dear Gabby, going on now three and a half, almost four years, but the pain is still there. Storm, what do you do? We are living in stormy seasons. And this time of the year, spring season, our country, especially in the middle of our country, is inundated with thunderstorms and tornadoes. Just a few weeks ago, to be exact, May, May 7th, we had a tornado warning here for Berrien Springs. Do you remember that? And from that same cell, tornadoes touched down in Dawajiak, Marcellus, and Portage in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Right? I saw a skating rink in Dawajiak that destroyed, and there was a tree that you know, came down, pulled down an electrical um, pole, that caused a fire, and people came out and were talking, oh, this building was there for years, from generations to generations, right? In, in Portage, Michigan, you know, you saw, it's a nice location, it was by a lake, nice houses, but because the tornado came through, you saw trash and garbage and debris strewn all over the place, storms. But even though storms come, you find others who find that the spring season is a time to just go out and have fun, to exercise, to go to the beach. But yet still for others, the time is so excruciatingly painful. And when I use the term storm, it's, it's an all-inclusive manner. So natural acts of God Biological storms, psychological storms, mental health, socioeconomic, socioeconomic storms, right? Joblessness, homelessness, or the unhoused, marital or family troubles, storms. So I ask the question, I ask myself the question, do Christians have a blueprint for surviving the storms of life? What's a, what's, what's a blueprint? A blueprint is a replica of the original, right? Sir John Frederick Williams Ertzel, he was the father or the developer of this blueprint phenomenon. He was a mathematician, an astronomer, a chemist, right? But what it does, it takes a copy of the original and makes it available for others to apply. So it's there a plan in the Bible, a blueprint in the Bible that we can copy in our lives and apply to our lives, right? To, to, to survive and to, to mitigate the effects of storms when they come. Whatever the storms may be, is there a blueprint that we can follow? Our storm that we might be going through right now it's not a physical one for some of us, as Okene was. But understand that if we live long enough, we are going to go through a storm. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter 4 and verse 12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning fire tri fiery trials, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Don't be surprised when the trials come and think something strange happened to you. And I'm sure that we have all heard the expression that we're either going into a storm, coming out of a storm, or in a storm right now. So we're all going to face storms. Storm! Storms. How do we survive the storms of life? Let us pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I ask you that in this place today, 
you will release the kind of anointing that imparts life. Challenge us, change us, transform us, speak to us, correct us, mold us, meet, make us, shape us, break us. Whatever you will, God, we are open to you. We won't legislate the, the movement and the activities of the Holy Spirit today. But we will actively and passively surrender to the dictates and the mandates of heaven. Open up the portal windows of glory and flood this house with the kind of anointing that chases demons through doors, heals diseases and loose bowels and sets the captives free. Oh God, today release a healing, anointing, a healing. And I'm not going to, to even wait to praise you. I'm going to praise you in advance. Your credit is good with me, God. Spirit of the living God, have your way today. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I wish I had somebody who would give him some praise. Give him some praise. God has been too good. You know, even though we might be in a storm today, we can still praise him. In fact, now is the time to praise him. He has been too good to us. Just look over your shoulders and recount how the Lord has been good to you in the past. He will do the same for you today. He is the mighty, he's a mighty good God. And he's right here with us today. You know, in Ecclesiastes 4, verses 9 through 12, and thank you, little Orville Jr., for reading the scripture lesson. He's grown up so much, I almost didn't recognize him. <laughs> Did such a good job. You know, we are, taught, we are told about a three-stranded cord. We're going to talk more about that. But in 1 Corinthians 13, which is the love chapter, verses 1 to 13, we find a blueprint for surviving the storms of life. Right? And here is where the Lord led me to share this message with you. In verse 13, it says, the last verse, and here it is. Now abides faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. That's our blueprint. Now abide, abides faith, hope, and love. So in our scripture reading, Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12, reminds us that two are better than one, and the three together is better than two together. Solomon uses the analogy of a threefold cord. He reminds us that a one-stranded cord is weak, by itself. A double-stranded cord is stronger, but a three-stranded rope is stronger than either. Think about this for a moment. If, you're in a, if you were in a storm and the, you're flooded around or out of your, your car or your house, you have to climb up on top of the vehicle or on top of your rooftop, and the rescue team comes with a helicopter and they let down a basket, a receptacle to, to rescue you, right? You want to know that that cord that attached from the heli heli helicopter to the, the receptacle is strong. You don't want a flimsy cord, right? You know when the helicopter picks you up, that you know, receptacle is going to be twisting and tossing all different directions, right? You don't want to be concerned about that. <laughs> so the cord that we use should be strong. A three-stranded cord is much stronger than a one-strand cord. There are times when you feel 
like you're in a stormy sea. Times when we need to anchor ourselves in someone stronger than ourselves. Today is such a time when we need such a strong rope to bind us to the rock of safety, right? When these three things, these three factors, faith, hope, love, are utilized and exercised together, they will enable us to weather any storm that may arise in our lives. And if we aren't properly anchored, then there is a tendency to drift when the storms come. Now, we aren't tied and connected. If we aren't tied and connected well enough by this strong threefold spiritual cord, then when the going gets tough, we just might find ourselves trying to run away. But in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13 tells us that now abides faith, hope, and charity. And we know charity is love. But here Paul was telling the Corinthians that when all else was stripped away, he wanted to find that the church excelled in these three. Faith, hope, and love. And by the way, we can find these three throughout other passages in the Bible. 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 3. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 8. Galatians 5 verses 5 and 6. Hebrews 6 verses 10 through 12. Huh? One term that stands out for me in this verse of verse 13 is the word abides. That which remains. Any, at any time the word abides is used, it means that which stays. Therefore now abides faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. These are what remain. We know many things in life do not last. It is said that the only thing that is constant is change. And moreover, when we live life long enough, we see that a lot of things don't last, such as your health, your relationships, your money, your family, your jobs, your memory, losing loved ones, your six-pack now becomes a one-pack. Your muscles. Many things in life don't last. And if we build our lives on, on things that move or things that don't last or things that have a weak foundation, then we won't last either. So we'll be taken over by the seasonal things that come and go. The Bible clearly identifies that when all is said and done, all we are going to have left is our faith, our hope, and our love. These three must pr be protected at all cost. Because if there's anything that the enemy seeks to destroy, it's your faith, your hope, and your love. I'm convinced that the devil doesn't need any of our material positions. He doesn't need your health. What he would like to take from us is our faith, our hope, and our love. Look at Job. Job lost his health. He lost his wealth. He lost his family. But the devil continued after him, wanting Job to give up his faith, give up his hope, give up his love, wanting him to curse God and die. So the devil isn't necessarily after what we possess or our our health. However, he uses them as avenues to get to our faith, our hope, and our love. And furthermore, if we fight him on these things, our material possessions, then we are missing the weightier matter, which is he comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. What he would like to assassinate in your life is your faith, your hope, and your love, when you're pressured and 
you're inundated and you're submerged with, with problems and, and, and difficulties and stress, you just feel like you want to give up sometimes. And that's what Satan wants you to do. He wants you to lose your faith. He wants you to lose your hope. He wants you to lose your love. But we have thank God for this blueprint. That which stays, that which remains, are faith, hope, and love. Faith, faith, the first component of this blueprint for surviving the storms of life. When Jesus confronted Simon Peter, he said, Simon, Satan would like to shift you as wheat, but I pray that your faith fails you not. I pray that you keep your faith. And right now he prays that you keep your faith. Jesus knew that Peter was impatient and impetuous and that he would be tested. So he prayed for him to keep his faith. And Jesus is praying for us right now to keep our faith. When we fight against the devil, it's not our eloquence or our wit or our education or our money that will keep us. But it is our faith in Jesus that will keep us. Our strength, brothers and sisters, is always in the invisible, the metaphysical. This includes such things like the spirit, the soul, heaven, hell, angels, huh? the almighty God, etc. Huh? So in short... The so-called metaphysical concepts include all that which the Bible refers to, refers to as things which are not seen. And the scripture further informs us, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 18. Your material positions are temporal, but your faith, your hope, and love are eternal. So we are fighting a spiritual battle. It's a battle, a spiritual storm that we are in. And the enemy attacks the things that we, are, that we are attached to in order to get at us. He never goes after the things that we don't love or that we have no passion for. No. He attacks the things that we are attached to for the purpose of destroying our faith. So that we will become hopeless, eventually become bitter, and eventually lose our love. Now, now faith is more than just making noise. More than just sounding brass or tinkling cymbals. Our faith must be accompanied by works and actions. We have got to see some fruits, like the, the, the story, the, the children's story said, right? We've got to show some fruits. Right? We can't say we have faith and, you know, we pray and we get up and we're still concerned and worried. We, we got to get up and give legs to our prayers. Right? Faith must go with our action. And Paul, Paul talks about having the gift of prophecy and the intellect to understand. But if all we have is the gift of prophecy and the intellect to understand without love, then we are like sounding brass and Tinkling symbol. The two must go hand in hand. And faith doesn't always show up in mature people, right? The little child, the little old lady, the little old man, right? Sometimes we see faith in the strangest places, right? They sh it shows up, but it's there, right? The Bible tells us in James 2 and verse 19 that thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well, the devil also believe and tremble. So the devil knows there, there's a God, but he does nothing about it. He tries to get us to, to lose our faith and our hope and our love. Huh? So we need to be careful, and if we're not careful, we're going to lose the three components that are necessary for us to stand. We may accomplish certain things in life, But God is not impressed by those. What he's impressed by is our faith, our hope, and our love for him and in him. You know, 
as we talk about faith and works, there was a, there was a Scotsman who rode people across a river. On one oar, he had carved the word faith. And on the other oar, he had carved the word works. One day as he was rowing, one of the passengers noticed the carvings and asked him about them. The Scotsman did not reply, but pulled in the, mor the oar marked works and started to row with only the one oar. The boat went around in circles. Then he pulled the oar marked faith and started to row only with the works oar. The boat again went around in circles, but this time in the opposite direction. He then rowed the boat o both oars and reached the other side of the bank safely. Before his passenger got off the boat, he said, A Christian must row his life using both oars. Faith and works. Only then will he reach heaven's shore. Faith is the first ingredient that the devil would like to take from us. That means that as life begins to, to sand away at you, and you begin to experience erosion, you will begin to lose some things. If you continue to live long enough, you will lose some friendship, friendships. You will lose some relationships, some loved ones, some jobs, some positions, some energy, some here, some memory, some muscles. Yes, we are going to lose some things, but just make sure that, that you are not losing your faith, your hope, and your love. These three must remain. So my challenge to you today is not to allow anything that you lose to destroy what you have left. You must have got these three components. You must have them. That if you lose, if you use them, you will always come out on top. You will always beat the devil. He may destroy your health. He may destroy your body. You may lose loved ones or even your life. But if you have the three things, in the end, in eternity, you will be there and he will be not. He will not. That's what I'm talking about. The importance of keeping our faith, our hope, and our love. Right? I wish I had some bounce back people in the house this morning. Huh? Resiliency. When you look at how, what the Lord has saved you from. When you look at how the, at how the Lord has delivered you. Huh? When you look at what you're going through right now and God is still carrying you through. You can't help but praise him. I wish I had some bounce back people in the house this morning. Thank God for who has been to us. Let's keep our faith. Oh yes, brothers and sisters. When you have lost your daughter, you don't lose your faith. When you have lost your mother, you don't lose your faith. Your spouse, you, don't, you didn't lose your faith. Your sister, you didn't lose your faith. Your aunt, your co-worker, your friend, your church sister, your church brother, you didn't lose your faith. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So it's not your checkbook or your house or your car or your physique. It's faith. Faith is leaning into God, right? Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, Faith is not a blind leap into the dark, but it's a confident leap into the arms of God. Often the end is not in view, but when this leap is made, right, <clears throat> landing is never in doubt. Faith has the capacity to behold what the eyes cannot see. Faith is the knowledge that God is in absolute control all of the situations of life. That's what I'm talking about, brothers and sisters. And he will continue to work things out for us. Faith cashes the checks that God has written in his word. Faith is the currency of heaven, the legal tender of heaven. Faith causes heaven to move. Faith can move mountains. Faith in Jesus allows transaction to take place between you and heaven. Faith brings heaven to earth. 
This is the only one life that pleases the Lord. It is a life lived in faith. The secret to experiencing and enjoying God's best is to let go of your life and place it in, the hand, in His hands. And, in his, and He will live through you and live it His way. Genuine biblical faith, even though it is intangible, can be seen in thousands of ways in the Bible. Yeah? And within your life and mine. It takes faith to stand when our others are falling. It takes faith to serve God when those around you won't. It takes faith to follow God into an unknown future, believing that he will work all things out for your good and for his glory. It takes faith to be like the widow of Zephyr, Zephyrapath. Zephyrapath in verse, 1 Kings 17. All she had left was a little oil. It takes faith to be a Daniel, faith to be a Shadrach, a Meshach, and a Bendigo, faith to be a Abraham, a David, a Peter, a blind man looking for a miracle. It takes faith to keep living after the passing of, the, of our dearly beloved Gabby. It takes faith to go on. Moreover, moreover, it takes faith to be a parent, faith to be a partner in a marriage, faith to be a friend, faith to deal with sickness, Faith to deal with the death of a loved one. Faith to go to work sometimes even though you might be catching hell there. Life is all about faith. When we lean or when we learn that God is in absolute control of all of it, then it will bind us more securely, securely to him and his, and his will for us. So the first component is faith. We won't sprinkle a little. We won't take two tablespoons. Or we won't use a cup off. Instead, we are going to douse and bathe ourselves in faith today. Satan can't prevail. You might, be, you, you might have taken her body, Satan, but you can't prevail. This is the full bathing. There is no measuring cup for this ingredient today. Right? This is all about faith. The faith, the first ingredient for surviving the storms of life. Hope, the second component of the blueprint. Paul says about hope that if we have no hope, we are of all men most miserable. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 9. The writer of Hebrews states that God has entered into a covenant with us that we might have hope, which is an anchor for our souls. Hebrews 6 and verse 19. In Romans, we are told that we are saved by hope. Romans 8 and verse 24. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is not seen is not hope. For what a man sees, why does he hope? Now hope is something you cannot see. It's also intangible. It's also metaphysical. But even though you can't see it, it embraces your future. It is the conviction that you still have the potential and the possibility of surviving. You know, sometimes people give up because they don't have hope. And we have hope this morning. Giving you money is not giving you hope. Giving you attention is not giving you hope. Giving you what you're whining for is not giving you hope, right? Hope is an anchor for your soul. Nobody lets down an anchor unless he, he realizes there is potential for drifting. And if you are not careful, you can drift away. So I'm not talking about tropical storms or hurricanes. I'm talking about just the normal motion of the ocean. Just our normal going and coming of life. The circumstances of life for which we have no control over, will eventually just rock us further and further so that you can drift away so quietly that you don't recognize how far you have gone from where you ought to be. This means that you should anchor yourself with hope. <clears throat> Hopelessness makes people shoot themselves in the street. So we have drive-by shootings. We have school shootings. We, we have murders, suicides, people shooting up drugs, addictions. It's because people have lost their hope. 
They are convinced that there's nothing beyond what they have already seen. And any time people become convinced that there's nothing beyond what they have already seen, then they lose hope. They terminate their future. Sometimes the pain they are experiencing is greater than their resources. So they end up implementing permanent solutions for temporary problems. They have lost their hope. We have to believe that there is something beyond what we have seen and what we have experienced in order to survive. Is there something left inside of us that says, I have something else I want to do, I want to see, I want to share, I want to spread His word. Is there something else that gives us hope to keep living? You know, sometimes you hear some elderly people talk, I'm tired. I've seen it all. I just want to go to sleep. They are losing hope. They think they have seen it all. But I encourage you today to not give up what you have to lose your hope. Believe that something is coming that you haven't seen yet. Eyes have not seen nor ear heard what the Lord has in store for us. Huh? Whenever you believe that something is coming that is greater for you, you can break that chain that's keeping you back. That shackle of abuse, low self-image, suicide ideation, whatever it is, whatever you have, hope you can break that chain. That's what I'm talking about. What is hope? What is hope? The biblical Definition of hope is something different from what's in Webster. It's a confident expectation which rests upon the promises of God. That's the biblical definition I want to use today. You can look up the, the Webster, definition of, Webster definition for yourself. In other words, hope is believing that God's word is true and can be trusted. Genuine hope is not wishful thinking but a confident expectation that God will do as he has promised. Hope takes the word of God at face value. Friends, we can believe the Bible because our hope is anchored in the word of God. It will see all that it expects come to pass. If not in time, then surely in eternity. And our hope will be finalized are finally realized in two splendid events, his return and his heaven's rewards. Hope! While we roam this world, things will not always go the way we, we want them to. But let's keep our hope. The last, the last component, love. Love. The third component is what the enemy would really like to take from us. He wants to destroy your love. And the funny thing about it is that you can still have a smile on your face and lose your love. You can still make your sacrifices and lose your love. You can show up at the right place and on time say the right things and still lose your love. Paul says you can even give your body to be burnt and still have no love. Love is the thing that is the hardest to hold on to because love is what makes most vulnerable. Love is what brings strong men down to their knees. Love is what makes you say, I'm not going to do this again for you, but just this last time. Love was what kept Jesus to the cross. There wasn't a nail or a log that could keep him there on the cross. It was love for us. When he looked out and saw us, he endured the cross because of his love. So he rides the storm with you because of love. Then how can you say then carest thou not that we perish when he is right here in the boat with you? 
He loves you so much with an everlasting love. He's riding in the storm with us right now. We just need to continue to trust in him and call his name. He's riding in the storm with us. Oh, God, thank you today for riding in the storm with us. Huh? The divorce rates are ever increasing due to lack of love. Satan is stealing away our love from each other. He is stealing our love for ourselves. And sometimes, if other people say the same things to us that we say to ourselves, we'll get upset at them. You know that? Well, how do you treat yourself? How do you talk to yourself? We have to love ourselves before we can love other people. We must keep our love. Because if we don't love ourselves, then we can't truly love others. So we need to guard our heart because the enemy wants to take our love. When we have love, it does not matter what we are going through. Do you know that? Especially if you're dating and you're just in the, the initial stages of a relationship. You could be hungry, no money, no, no place to live. But as long as you have each other, you feel good. <laughs> right? <laughs> You have love, so that's going to solve everything, right? And love will make you look like a fool sometimes. Yeah? You will do, do anything for the one that you love. Therefore, when we love God, we will do, need to do everything for him and anything for him. Because he has done so much for us. It's because of love why I got up this morning. It's because of love why I'm clothed in my right mind. It's because of love why, why I'm not on a ventilator this morning. Love that will not let me go. I thank the Lord for the triple bypass he gave me this morning. I bypassed the cemetery. I bypassed the morgue. I bypassed, oh, I'm at the church. But oh, you know what I mean. Thank God it's because of his love. Thank him. Love that caused me to survive. Huh? Consequently, I'm a survivor. It was love that lifted me when I was acting the fool and when I was sinking deep in sin. It was love that lifted me. Huh? I'm a survivor today, are you? Are you loving the love of God to be in you, to lift you up? Oh, yes. Love will not let us go. We should be convinced as believers that God loves us and wants the best for us and wants to save us. So let's just keep walking with God, remembering that love is not getting everything you want because of his love for you, he will withhold some things from you. Sometimes God allows us to go through storms to allow us to give up some stuff. He loves us so much that when we come out on the, of the storms, we will have better than before or more than before. Just look at Job. Job's experience, right? He had twice as much. So when we realize there's a storm may come over us, but we know that God is still with us. He is in control. We won't worry. God loves us so much that the things we are crying about today are the same things we will be laughing about after the storm. And God uses each storm that comes in our life to take us to the next place he wants us to go to. He uses storm to cause us to depend on him rather than ourselves. And you know, genuine biblical love is rare. It's a rare commodity in this world. There are plenty manifestations. But I'm talking about the biblical love described in the Bible. Right? If you don't possess the right kind of love, which is the horizontal love and the vertical love, we will lose it. Without genuine biblical love, we are wasting our time trying to live for God. Why? Because we will always be out of step on one level or another. When we love the Lord as we should, nothing will be allowed between us. When we love our brother we should, as we should, nothing will to be tolerated. So let's keep our faith, our hope, and our love. We are looking for a blueprint for the storms of life. 
we have won. Let's not lose it. These three remain. Faith, hope, and love. Right? And God will use what you have left to bless you. So do you have some faith, some hope, and some love left inside of you? God will use what you have to bless you. Keep in mind that he does not need what you have lost in order to bless you. He will always use what you have left to bless you. If it is a pot of oil, he will use it to bless you. If you have five loaves and two fishes, he will use it to bless you. If you have the jawbone of a donkey, he will use it to bless you. If you have the slingshot and five stones, he will use it to bless you. So when the storms of life come, and we know they will come, if you are these three components, faith, hope, and love, you will survive. See the storm clouds coming. Hear the rumbling roar of the thunder. See the flashing intimidation of the lightning. Hear the howling blowing of the winds. A storm is coming. Do you have some faith? Do you have some hope? Do you have some love? This is our blueprint. Survive the storms of life. Satan can't take it if you don't give it to him. Huh? He seeks to kill them, but he can't take it if you give it to him. Do you have hope today, brothers and sisters? Do you have faith? Do you have love? Situations can't secure it. But do you have it? Love. The devil couldn't take it. Do you have it? Faith. What is your response to God? I need a message this morning from the Lord as we go through our difficult circumstance of life. We lost our sweet, beloved Gabby. Beautiful, effervescent Gabby. Huh? It's not natural. For a child to go before the parents. Storms. I talk about earlier how sometimes multiple situations and issues can cause you to face storms. Sometimes it only takes one incident. Something like a loss of a loved one, a dear loved one. Sweeps you off your feet. Huh? You go crashing down. But understand that Satan will use these situations to cause us to lose our, hope, our faith, our hope, and our love. And these three must remain. So I encourage you today, keep them alive. Whatever you face, whatever you go through, we have a blueprint to survive the storms of life. Did anyone receive a blessing in God's house today? Thank God for the blueprint. And thank you, Professor Lloyd, for sharing with us that message about the blueprint of faith, love, and hope. And I think the after effect of following the blueprint is wonderful peace. And that's why you asked us to sing this as our closing song today. Wonderful peace, far away in the depths of my spirit tonight rolls a melody sweeter than song. In celestial strains it unceasingly falls, or my soul like an infinite calm. Wonderful song. Let's stand together as we sing this hymn because of our commitment to keep a firm hold on our faith, our hope, and our love. Far away the depths of my spirit tonight rolls a melody sweeter than some in celestial like strain it unceasingly falls oh 
my soul like an infinite cup. Peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. What a treasure, what a treasure I have in this wonderful peace, peace. buried deep in my innermost soul, so secure. Wonderful peace. Wonderful oh, yeah. peace coming down from the Father. He gives peace to us this morning. Sweep over my spirit forever. Whatever we're going through, he gives peace. strain of the song which the ransom will sing in that heavenly kingdom will be peace, peace oh God thank you for your peace wonderful peace coming down from the Father One more time. Peace, peace. Peace, peace. peace, peace. Oh, wonderful peace. Wonderful Need some peace this morning? Peace. Raise your hands. Need some peace this morning? Raise your hands. What are you going through right now? He gives peace. Sweet he has it available for you. Struggles? Storms? Mental pray. issues? Us, of a loved one, he gives peace. Peace, 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 peace. Wonderful, wonderful peace. peace. What a mighty God we serve. Oh, yes, whatever our situation, whatever our problem, Jesus gives us peace. Let us keep our hope. Let us keep our faith. Let us keep our love. Amen. Let us pray. Let us pray. Let us pray. God, 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 we thank you so much today. I thank you, Lord, for today. I was in need of a message today from you, Lord, and so I was not so much talking to the people in front of me. I was talking to myself, Lord. Yes, yes, yes. I thank you for the reminder to keep my faith, to keep my hope, to keep my love because circumstances sometimes come and if we're not careful, they can cause all the rocks from our feet to be moved. Our security blanket can be wished away from us. 
But thank you for a reminder this morning, God, that this is what Satan wants to do in our lives. He wants to kill our faith, our hope, and our love. I also pray a special prayer for all the families that are going through loss. I remember the Spates family. May you continue to encircle them with your arms of love and your mercy. May you encourage them as they go through their grieving process now. May you use us now to as support members or support group for them as they go through their, their peace or their storm. Give them peace. And there are others that we don't know about right here in the congregation this morning. Again, encircle them with your loving arms of love, mercy, and peace. Help them to keep the three-stranded cord of faith, hope, and love. Because when everything else fails, if they are the three, these three, they will be securely fastened to you. Bless us to this end, Lord. And again, we recognize you and we thank you for being our God and our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. After this service is finished, we're going to go right into our potluck fellowship so you're invited all of you are invited whether you brought something with you or not doesn't matter once you have your appetite you're invited to the potluck that will begin immediately and then after the potluck we will have an afternoon uh, continuation of our special mental health sabbath so we invite all of you to stay by with us for the afternoon session we'll have a presentation uh, by sister uh, hamilton Dr. Hamilton, who will be with us, and a question and answer session, so you don't want to miss that. So stay by with us, enjoy the fellowship, enjoy the afternoon service that will help you develop skills for dealing with stress, stress. right? Pre stress prevention and stress management. You don't want to miss this, right? My wife and I will do the presentation. She's from her, the, her, the background of a medical health professional. I'm coming from the background of a social worker. But we have seen stress, the impact of stress in our society for far too long, and we need, again, another platform to deal with it. Amen. Okay? Amen. So, don't, so don't miss it. So stay by with us. Let's, let's uh, end with...